Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mike, I'm Mike Williams. This is our session on diffusion sensor imaging and neurodevelopment. And I'm going to be the moderator. The other presenters are going to take each a part of uh, the presentations. Uh, Carlos Apowitz will cover our methods of DTI. Christina Patrick will cover very early language development. And Jessica Zamzo and Aria Tart Zelvin will do school aged children with language and executive control functions. And hopefully this all works. Here we go. Uh, for this data analysis, we use the MRI study of normal development that you can download from your uh, INDAR site. It's basically a sample that was highly selected for normality. They were very exclusive in terms of the parameters they chose for normal brain development. And here's the INDAR site. If you'd like to, uh, they have a lot of behavioral data as well as um, neuroimaging data. If you're interested in this kind of analysis, it's a great data set to work with because it's so well collected. But I would check out their site for also for behavioral measures. If you're interested in, you know, just the relationship between memory measures and language, you can find them all here. These are the centers that participate in the, in the data collection. You can see there's the major children's research centers around the country. What's uh, important about this is they had very high data integrity. So when they collected the scans, when they collected the behavioral measures, everything was extremely well done. And the data was, is very clean. Now I'm going to give you a five minute introduction to DTI. I'm sure there are people in the audience who conduct DTI analyses now, but there are probably others who've just heard about it. Uh, DTI is a, is a structural imaging method that begins with a DTI protocol. And DTI protocol will render the uh, diffusion tensor here, which is a three by three matrix, indicating the directionality and the amount of diffusion across tissues. And if you have, if you have tissues like this axonal pathways, you have a constraint of the, of the diffusion tensor. And then, then you reduce the matrix, the DTI matrix, to a, a set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It's basically a kind of factor analysis or reduction of the matrix. So the eigenvalues tell you the degree, the amount of diffusivity. The eigenvectors tell you the direction. So you develop a centroid for tissues each voxel will have the, the diffusion tensor representing the degree of diffusivity and its, its uh, direction. And you verify these into two measures. The variance of the eigenvalues is the FA value, the fractional anisotropic measure. So that's the variance of the eigenvalues. The variance is high. That means there's a directionality to the uh, motility of water. If it's low, that means there's, there's, there's not directionality to it. All the eigenvalues are roughly the same. For mean diffusivity is the mean of the eigenvalues. That's the amount of diffusivity. And you can get uh, tissue uh, contrast with this. So CSF, big area of just uh, essentially water, a little more viscous than water, but you have a large amount of uh, mean diffusivity, small FA, because there's not structure there. So the water molecule has, is free to, free to move, and you have a lot of movement, but it's not structured or constrained. In gray matter, you have small mean, diffusi mean diffusivity, say that 10 times, and uh, small FA. You don't have structure there. The water molecule disperses uh, equally in all directions, more or less, it, but, but a smaller amount of, dif of diffusion. And finally, in white matter, in, say in the corpus callosum, this one here, you have high, high FA because the water molecule has been, is, is uh, constrained in its diffusivity. Uh, but less mean diffusivity. So the FA value is going to be high there because the white matter pathways have constrained water motility and diff diffusivity. The tensor centroid then has this shape here, this directionality to it. Other white matter tracks also have the same amount of FA and diffusivity, but the directions are different. And the eigenvectors from the previous analysis tell you those directions. And I know I'm going a little fast here, but... Um, we, we've practiced this a few times so that we get it all, in, all done at the right time. And, I, and of course, any questions that you have about the, about the presentations, please ask them at the end. We're trying to have time at the end and so on. Well, now you've seen these wonderful color-coded, directionally encoded uh, DTI Im images. What these are is the, the luminance, the, the light level, is the magnitude of the FA, and the color is directionality. So the orange and red is left-right. The um, 
green areas are anterior posterior and the blue are inferior superior. So you color code these and you see these nice white matter pathways that come out from just this graphing of the FA values. Okay, so the rest of the uh, uh, presentations will cover specific applications of this to developmental uh, development of the, of the uh, brain. And I want to make, leave just a couple points to keep in mind. First of all, these are our initial studies. This is our first uh, hack at this data. And we've mapped out some patterns. I was gratified that we got relationships just with age and, and uh, DTI measures. That means that all our methodology was probably working. But this is our first, so we have a lot of behavioral measures. The unique thing about this presentation, about this seminar, is the behavioral measures that we used. Almost all the other literature before has not has just examined age and a few uh, cognitive variables. With, the, with this data set, we had a lot of cognitive variables to analyze. The, um, and I didn't start the clock. <laughs> The, <laughs> the second thing I want to keep, you want to keep in mind is that DTI is a structural imaging method. It's not, a, it's not an fMRI analysis. What you, what you hope to see are large patterns over the course of many years correlated with cognitive variables, not specific patterns like you would see in an fMRI. When I look at these, I get them confused, and I think, well, if that pattern in the left hemisphere, it must be like the pattern in fMRI, and it's, and it's very different. Uh, we're not looking for... Uh, such discrete spatial locations for cognitive functions, they tend to be kind of broad and they cover many years of, of data. Okay, with that I'm going to leave it, turn it over to Carlos Apoets who will do our methods. Thank you. I'm going to just give uh, you guys a very brief overview of the methodology we used in this project, maybe give you some things to think about, but hopefully not bore you too much with the technical specific, uh, specifics. If you want to be bored after all, after we're finished with this, by all means come up. We'll, I'll talk to you about every specific part of this, and I can put you to sleep for the rest of the night, catch up on some of that jet lag. But today I'm going to give you a brief overview of the methodology used and then show you an overall pattern in our data set of what happens to these measures with age. Um, where am I aiming? Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, so to begin with, what do we have from the data set? From this data set that we downloaded online, and that's the beauty of all of this, you're welcome to download it just as we did and do all of your favorite cognitive measures and analyses, and maybe you can even use our analytic method as a model for what you want to do. But what do we have? We have T1 data. What T1 data is, is a nice high resolution structural scan. It's the kind of thing that you're used to seeing whenever you see a structural uh, MRI. And on panel A is an example of a T1 from our data set. Next we have an FA map. This FA map is shown in panel B and it tells you exactly what Michael explained. And again, very nice, very obvious DTI measure. Finally, we have what are the uh, principal eigenvalues, and there are three of them. These aren't really important, but what you should know is you can take the mean of them to generate the MD map, which we use for inference as well, uh, and uh, shown in panel D. And finally, the last thing that I'd like you to consider is when you download this data, it's all in the native acquisition space. That is, it's in the same area, it's in the same field of view as it was acquired in. And that's important to remember for later on. So the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out some scheme of spatial manipulation. You might be wondering, well, why do we want to spatially manipulate any data? All right, manipulation of data is bad. Except for any sort of neuroimaging research where you need some commonality in order to be able to make group comparisons. And the, the two things, the two major things that we need to do is we need to move the data into the same space. This is typically referred to as co-registration. And we need to warp the data so that it looks rather similar. And this is called normalization. And because 
DTI data is inherently rather low resolution data, it does become a problem when you try to do these two things to DTI data themselves. There are a number of specific algorithms designed exactly to deal with the co-registration normalization of DTI data, but the solutions that they come up with tend to be relatively poor and there tends to be a great deal of misregistration. And the reason is, is because DTI data is rather low resolution. What you see in this graphic here, this is uh, an example of just some T1 data. And this is the exact same area. Oh, I'm pointing down there where you can't see, sorry. This is uh, the T1 data. And this is the exact same area imaged on DTI. And I think you can very obviously tell that you can kind of start to make out some structure, some difference in tissue, whereas when you start looking here, you just get confused. Right? And the same thing happens to your computer. When you plug it into some registration algorithm, it has to deal with this, and it may get very confused, screwing up your analyses. So in this project, we simply didn't use the DTI to compute any of our manipulations because, as I mentioned initially, all of the scans were acquired during the same scanning session, the T1s and the DTI data, which means that they're in the same native space, the same native orientation. So all we have to do is compute our deformations on the T1 data, which has much higher resolution, looks great, doesn't have all these problems that DTI does. And once we have that solution, we simply apply it to the DTI scans. Now, the one thing that we have to consider is because the diffusion imaging and uh, T1 scans do have different acquisition parameters, one of the biggest and most obvious being the field of view is different, uh, they don't look the same when you first open them up. And so what we do is we register them so that they're in the same exact spot. Now, this isn't really that much of a manipulation. It's really just shifting things over. And we do this through translating the data in x, y, and z directions. That is, we move it left, right, up, down, back, front. And an illustration of this is simply here. I know this is a horrible looking slide, so bear with me. What we have here is our T1 data. And this demonstrates the slice at which we're looking at here. And when I open up the original FA and try to overlay it, it's, well, first over here, which you can see doesn't overlap in the slightest bit. And second, the slice it's showing me is right down here. But all we have to do is we translate that data, and again, in X, Y, and Z. And all of a sudden, our FA data and our T1 data are in the exact same space. And here, the red represents the FA. Behind it is the T1. And that looks like pretty much a very nice match, right? And once we have that, all of our problems are alleviated. Because then we can do all our spatial manipulation on the T1 data, which again has higher resolution. And there are so many more algorithms for processing it. So what do we do? We generate a template. Now, this is an important step that I'd like to highlight. Because we're dealing with developmental data, we didn't want to use any normal uh, template. I know most of the studies that you look at in uh, adults use maybe an MNI template or something like that. But here, we didn't want to do that because there's a great deal of difference between a child's brain and an adult's brain. All right? So we didn't want to just assume that we could move them there and have all that inherent error. So once we generate our own template, and for this project, I did generate a unique template for each of the specific data sets that you're going to be uh, hearing about later. Maybe a bit of overkill, I'm not sure. Uh, but you know, try, I tried as best as I could to minimize our error. Once you have this template generated, uh, then you co-register and normalize each subject's T1 to that template. Again, the template represents the mean space of the sample. The co-registration is simply moving it over. The, uh, the normalization is warping it. And once you have that, you can simply take the solutions for those transformations and apply them to the MD and the FA data. That is, you don't use the MD or an FA data to compute anything. You just apply transformations that have been previously determined. 
And this produces T1 and DNSA maps all in a common space. Template generation for this project was done using the Dartel toolbox, which uh, gets run in SPM. And if you ever use that, you know it's a very nice way of generating any sort of normal templates. And what's really nice about Dartel, without going into many of the specifics, is it generates both a gray matter and a white matter map, which you may think might be of interest for us since we're dealing with gray matter and white matter. And once we use the, once we generate this template, I really need to highlight that this is the average shaped brain of your sample, so there's less bias in subsequent analysis, and you have much smaller errors. And then all we do is we co-register and normalize. So here's the original T1 data. It gets co-registered. We compute the solution, and the solution is X. Then we take that co-registered data and we normalize it. We compute the solution. The solution is Y. Once we have that, all we have to do, take our FA map, apply solution X, it's co-registered, apply solution Y, it's normalized. And that's pretty much it. And then all of our data is in the same space. And we can do all kinds of analyses on it. And the type of analyses that we started off with was simply looking at each of these uh, data sets individually, T1, FA, and MD. And we uh, looked at the regression of age. We looked at the regression of some specific cognitive variables, which my colleagues will tell you about. And we also looked at the regression of the cognitive variable with subtracting out the effect of age to see if there's anything left over. I do need to just highlight very quickly that for each model, we modeled handedness, sex, and total intracranial volume as a nuisance regressor, except for the very young children, they didn't have handedness. Um, and this is a very important point because I know a lot of you are asking yourselves, well, sex might be the most interesting thing to look at in a data set like this. Uh, and you're probably right. It, there are a lot of very interesting things that we could look at further. This is, again, just the initial first pass analyses. So later on, we'll definitely be looking at sex, uh, perhaps handedness, definitely not uh, total intracranial volume because we're not interested in how the brain grows. And lastly, uh, I just want to point out that for all the subsequent analyses that you will see, they're corrected at uh, an alpha level of 0 0.05 of an FWE correction, family-wise error correction, and the spatial extent is consistent with image smoothness. Um, so for our first set of analyses, I simply looked at the total sample, and the total sample ranges from three months to 16 years. Our mean is eight years. and uh, most of them are right-handed, about half male, half female. And these are the breakdowns of the subsequent analyses that we'll be presenting later. But first, I'd like to show you the T1 data. So these are correlations with uh, age in T1. And what you see in the red, what you see in the red are the... Uh, the weak correlations, the weak relationships, what you see in the greenish yellow are the moderate correlations, and what you see in the blue are the strongest correlations across the entire sample. And I should point out that these are gray matter volume decreases as age increases. Okay? Uh, I think one of the most interesting things that you should notice here is that between age 3 and 16, the entire brain changes, which I think we, I think we can all agree is probably good. Uh, and besides that, the, other, the only other thing that I'd like to point out is something that I'm not, I really wasn't expecting, and I think it's something that we really weren't looking for, is a lot of the, uh, the strongest relationships seems to be happening in the orbital, frontal, and uh, temporal poles. Oh, okay. So uh, what you're looking at here are FA differences. Again, same relationships, the red, weak, the yellowish, uh, moderate, gr uh, blue, strong. And what you see here is that between three months and 16 age, the entire brain basically changes, which I think might be a good thing. Uh, and the strongest changes seem to be occurring around the temporal lobes 
and in the parietal cortex here. Uh, and there is, even though it might be a bit hard for you to glean while this thing is spinning, and I'm sorry I can't stop it on this projector, uh, but there is a slight bit of a laterality difference. It seems like the left hemisphere has more pronounced changes. Ah. And finally, we have changes with MD, same thing with the red, yellow, and blue. And what you should notice here is, again, a whole lot of changes. And these are decreases in uh, diffusivity with age, which you should hope to see with some establishment of, uh, uh, of structure, structures, of white matter structures. And once again, some of the most profound changes are happening in the frontal lobes, but a lot of involvement of the temporal lobes, a lot of work going on sort of in the uh, occipital inferior parietal lobe as well. And I just, to very quickly summarize the strongest, strongest patterns of change, what you see in the red are the areas where the gray matter volume is decreasing the most. What you see in the green are areas where you see the most or structural organization occurring with age, and what you see in blue is the greatest decreases in diffusivity with aging. Thank you, I hope I didn't bore you too much, and now we'll get into some of the more interesting stuff uh, with Ms. Christina Patrick telling you about very young children. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about our first sample, which is very young children, and um, we looked at language development in the sample. Um, so some of what we know about some of what we know about uh, gray matter development in very young children is that there are actually rapid increases in gray, develop, uh, gray matter development in the first couple years, um, and then gray matter continues to increase, but at slower rates um, for the for this age group. Um, we especially see increases in um, the frontal and temporal regions, um, and you'll start to see you start to see sort of subcortical um, and parietal lobe decreases in gray matter um, towards the end of this age group. Um, in regard to white matter, we're seeing high rates of increases in white matter again in the first two years of life, and then white matter continues to increase at lower rates. Um, white matter development begins in the sensory motor areas and, um, and increases at the highest rates in those regions, but is also increasing in a similar trajectory in the temporal and frontal regions. Um, and as Carol mentioned, in our, in our sample, we did see a similar pattern to what we would expect here. We saw a similar pattern in our um, sample across age, which is good. <laughs> Um, so, what we know about language is that language acquisition actually occurs in a similar trajectory to brain development. So we're seeing rapid increases in language acquisition in the first few years of life. Um, so you have this very steep slope here, just like we saw with cortical growth. Um, and then it kind of levels off, you see um, sort of slower rates of um, language acquisition and again, at the same time, slower rates of uh, brain development. Um, again, myelination occurs um, in the sensory motor regions first, and then we're seeing Heschel's gyrus developing, and language areas are, ha are um, developing later. So we, we might expect to see similar relationships between language development and brain development um, as we see with just age in brain development. <coughs> All right, so that's exactly what we're going to look at in, um, in this very young sample. We want to look at structural changes in gray and white matter um, as they relate to, to increases in both receptive and expressive language in very young children. So we have, um, we have a very young sample of um, children zero to four years, and then um, we'll also be looking at children three to seven years. So it's, it's two subsamples, which I'm going to talk about right now. Um, so as Carol mentioned, this is our whole sample. Um, I am going to specifically be talking about these very young children first. Um, so these are three to 52 month olds, um, mean age of 23 months and about 50% female. Uh, we don't have handedness because they're just 
too little to have handedness preferences. Um, Okay, and so the measures that we used for this sample, or well, we didn't really use, but that we acquired from the data set for this sample, um, they gave the preschool language scale the third edition. I think we're at the fifth edition at this point, but this was a little while ago. Um, and this looks at auditory comprehension and expressive communication skills. Those are the two subscales on this, um, on this test. And they measure um, even pre-linguistic abilities, so you can look at very, very young infants um, all the way up to... Um, to older children, um, looking at early prelinguistic skills and language comprehension communication as it develops. Um, so first we just wanted to see what the relationship with age and raw scores on um, these measures was. And as we would kind of hope to see, there was a linear, very strong relationship. So as children are getting older, they're performing better on these tasks, both auditory comprehension and expressive communication. And um, it's actually almost a perfectly direct relationship, linear relationship. So that's about as strong as you can get. Um, OK, so looking at this age group, we first looked at gray matter development across age. So Carol already talked about um, sort of the whole sample, what we're, what we're seeing across age. And, um, the, the difference with this very young group is that we're actually seeing gray matter increases, um, particularly in the parietal lobes, the orbital frontal, uh, um, the orbital frontal poles, the temporal poles, um, and we are seeing small bits of, um, if you can sort of see in there, there's a little bit of blue which indicates negative correlation, so that means that we're seeing na um, gray matter decreases subcortically. Um, I should also point out too that we have this little scale here to remind you, um, but this, uh, these orange reddish colors are associated with positive relationships and the blue, bluish greenish is associated with negative relationships. Um, in regard to white matter development across this age group, um, we're basically seeing white matter developing across the whole cortex. A um, Little bit more in the left hemisphere but really it's kind of happening everywhere and it's corresponding really nicely to this white matter organization, um, the increases in white matter organization are corresponding really nicely with decreases in diffusivity. Um, so we're seeing greater white matter integrity over time. Okay, so now we looked at the relationship between those early language skills, so the auditory comprehension and expressive communication skills as measured by the PLS, um, and brain development. So we wanted to see if we could, if there was actually a relationship between gray and white matter um, and performance on these measures. And what we saw actually, again, this is age, that it, which I just showed you, the relationship between age and, um, and this is actually FA, white matter development. Um, what we saw was almost a perfect relationship. Um, so basically, uh, early language skills are, um, are relating to brain development in almost exactly the same way as age is relating to brain development. Um, so in this really young group, I mean, we, we would expect this given what those, um, those early scatter plots showed, that, that very strong correlation um, with age. But, but basically what we're seeing in this group is that um, early language skills are sort of just a proxy for normal development, keeping in mind that we have a, a very normal sample. And then again, this is just the right hemisphere. You see the same thing that um, this is relationship between age and white matter development, and this is relationship between uh, expressive language skills and um, white matter development. And I should also say that the relationships are very similar when you look at auditory comprehension. Um, the relationships are very sim uh, similar when you look at gray matter. So this is sort of across the board. Brain development um, is, is looking the same whether you relate it to age or you relate it to language development. And, and we know that also because when we regressed out um, the effect of age, we lost all of our effects. So it's really just kind of a function of age which is good that the measures are measuring development. Okay, um, so back to our whole sample. Um, we next looked at uh, preschool age children. Um, 
And so for this group, we have we have kids three to seven, mean age of four and a half, 50% uh, female, and now um, we we're again primarily right-handed. Now we have handedness data. So in this group, um, we looked at measures, uh, two different language measures, um, actually three. From the differential ability scale, we looked at verbal comprehension, naming, vocabulary. Um, the DAS is often used for children who um, might not be typically developing. So, uh, it, but it certainly can be used with, with typically developing children. But it is a question as to whether it's the best measure to use in this type of sample that's a very normal sample. Um, and so I'll get at that a little bit later. Uh, but the verbal comprehension uh, subtest is really just looking at the ability of children to follow directions um, and to kind of complete tasks based on verbal instructions. And then naming vocabulary is uh, pretty similar to the express expressive vocabulary test. It's just a, you show them a picture and they, they name the object. So just a very simple expressive naming um, task. We also looked at the NEPSI, um, which is a a uh, very broad neuropsychological, de developmental neuropsychological test. Um, we just looked at the semantic word generation, um, which is basically just semantic verbal fluency, animals and food and drink. Okay, so first looking at our DAS measures, um, we see over time that they do still have a, we're still seeing a linear relationship with age. So, um, you know, raw scores are increasing in a linear fashion with age, but there's a lot of variability, and um, it's, not, it's not showing that nice trajectory like the PLS score showed, where it was almost this perfect linear relationship. So there's still a lot of variability in the sample so, um, across this task. So we may expect that something other than age is accounting for performance, something in addition to age, I should say. Uh, similarly, in our semantic uh, word generation task, we see um, we see performance increasing in a linear fashion, but there's a lot of variability. This is accounting for about 55% of the variance, so we've still got 45% of the variance that's accounted for by something other than age. Okay, so in this sample, which is the the preschool sample, um, we're seeing a very similar trajectory to what we saw um, across age in the, in the very young sample. So we're still seeing increases in specific gray matter regions, the orbital frontal poles, temporal poles, um, some areas of the parietal lobes, and we're seeing a little bit more pronounced decreases in subcortical gray matter. Okay. Um, when we're looking at white matter in this sample, we see um, the, uh, the FA in the left hemisphere looks pretty similar to what we saw before. So you're seeing a lot of increases in, in white matter organization in the left hemisphere. What's interesting is that you're also seeing increases in diffusivity in the frontal lobes, um, which, you know, a lot of people think of FA and MD as opposites of each other, and they're really not. So you can have increases in diffusivity while, we're, while the frontal lobes are still developing and um, this, this basically just means that there's more white matter developing in this area, but it's not yet organized. We don't have really great um, white matter integrity yet, but we're starting to really see development of those frontal lobes, which is nice. Um, in the right hemisphere, um, we're seeing increases in white matter integrity in the coronal radiata. Um, corresponding with left hemisphere decreases. So uh, the right hemisphere increases seem to be represent, might be representing cortical cortical inhibitory projections. Um, so left hemisphere decreases in coronal radiata may indicate similar processes emanating from the right hemisphere. So this difference might, um, this, this difference between positive and negative associations might be indicative of solidification of hemisphere dominance, which is starting to happen in this age group. Might be. Um, okay, so looking at the specific tasks on the DAS, we didn't find, we actually didn't find any relationships between the DAS naming score, naming vocabulary score, and gray matter, white matter development, um, even when not controlling for age. So, uh, one of our, I mean, we do have a, a fairly small sample, but one of our um, theories is just that this task may be too easy, so even younger children are doing very well on it, um, and so it's just not allowing enough of uh, 
trajectory to happen. Um, but regardless, we didn't see any relationships there. We did see one um, interesting relationship when looking at uh, verbal comprehension and uh, brain development. So what we saw was, again, this is what's happening across age with white matter development. We're seeing increased uh, white matter organization in the left hemisphere. And when you look at the relationship between verbal comprehension and white matter, um, we're seeing a positive relationship between white matter tracts from the left mesial temporal lobe. Um, crossing the posterior corpus callosum, most prominently in the forceps major. So this might support a relationship between semantic knowledge and medial temporal regions. Um, and we do know that, for instance, temporal lobectomy patients often show deficits in semantic fluency, um, so that sort of supports this relationship. Um, again, all findings are washed out when we control for age. So what that tells us is that verbal comprehension isn't this verbal comprehension task isn't necessarily measuring anything um, unique to a that age is not measuring, but it's measuring unique aspects of what age is measuring, so specific aspects of normal development. Okay. All right. Um, when we looked at the semantic fluency task on the NEPSI, we saw that um, performance on this task was positively correlated with gray matter development in the occipital parietal region, um, which was kind of interesting. Uh, this could be related to some theories that say that uh, sort of commonly used words are stored in the occipital lobe. Um, it could also be that the children this age are, vi you know, as they're trying to think of animals, trying to think of food and drinks, they're visualizing those things. They're maybe having some episodic memories of seeing those objects. So um, in any case, it seems like occipital and parietal lobe development is, um, occipital lobe and, and posterior parietal lobe development are related to performance on this task. Again, like with all of um, the other things we've seen so far, when you regress out age, we lose all of our effects. So this is again measuring a, a specific aspect of normal age-related development, um, nothing sort of unique above and beyond age. And then finally, when we look at white matter, the um, uh, relationship between white matter and this task, we see a very um, similar relationship to what we saw with age earlier. Um, so semantic fluency is related to, to development of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, the arcuate fasciculus, and the uncinate unsin fasciculus. Um, it's also rated, related to decreases in the mesial portions of the left hemisphere. So I just want to note that this actually is the left hemisphere. Um, so this is the longitudinal fissure right here. And I'm just showing you, so this mesial part of the left hemisphere and then the right hemisphere is back here. Um, so uh, this again could be related to the solidification of hemisphere, hemispheric dominance. Um, or it could be related to something else, I'm not really sure. Um, and again, the relationships drop out when we control for age. So again, we're measuring a specific aspect of age-related development, nothing unique above and beyond age. Um, we didn't see any relationships between semantic fluency and uh, mean diffusivity, so diffusion isn't, doesn't seem to be related to this measure. Um, so just kind of to sum up, we saw um, age, that age was positively related to gray matter, it was related to gray matter increases in the parietal lobes and the orbital frontal poles um, and some of the temporal uh, poles as well, a little bit in the temporal lobes as well. Um, and later we saw decreases in subcortical gray matter. We did see some, some decreases in subcortical matter early on, but they seemed more pronounced uh, later as the children got closer to seven. Um, increases in white matter were also related to age, um, white matter organization throughout the brain, and this seemed to be most pronounced in the left hemisphere. Um, so one thing to note about language, it, um, language skills is that in the very young children, um, those kids under four, um, or up to four, we saw that, uh, that the relationship between uh, um, language skills and brain development was nearly identical to the relationship between age and and brain development. So um, language skills are sort of just a proxy, proxy for age and they're not necessarily measuring anything unique um, in regard to, link, uh, to brain development, brain maturation. Um, however, in our preschool age children, language skills seem to be corresponding to specific regions of maturation. Um, and so even though 
these, uh, these effects wash out when we control for age, we are still seeing specific aspects of brain development that are related to performance on these tasks. So this may reflect acquisition of linguistic abilities related to specific areas of brain development. All right, so now we're going to look at um, an older age group, and uh, Jess Samzo is going to take over from here. So continuing along the course of development, I'm going to be um, reporting some findings on the relationship between semantic knowledge and structural changes in gray and white matter um, in late childhood and early adolescence. So we're going to be looking at ages 7 to 16. So cortical development during this period uh, follows a spatial and temporal pattern of development where earlier on, as Christina had mentioned, there's increases in gray matter density. And once those regions reach their peak density, they begin to then decrease over time. And uh, so during, in this age group, you'll expect to see some areas of decrease or mostly areas of decrease in gray matter density, but some areas of increase in specific. Um, okay. so. So researchers have theorized that changes in gray and white matter in these regions may be related to cognitive function associated with these regions. And this has been studied in this age group looking at intelligence, um, full-scale intelligence and verbal intelligence. And those have been associated with both increases and decreases in gray matter density and gray matter thickness in specific regions of the cortex. So as far as white matter development during this age period, you would expect increases in total white matter volume, increases in FA, which is that increase in structural organization of white matter tracts, and decreases in MD, which is mostly seen through increased myelination during this period. And again, we hypothesize that those cortical networks or those uh, white matter networks involved in for example, language processing would be associated, changes would be associated with uh, skill acquisition. So past research has looked at verbal IQ, reading ability, and language skills, and have found generally there's an increase in FA associated with improvement in performance and the decrease in MD, as you would expect. Okay, so for this uh, portion of the presentation, we'll be looking at structural changes in gray and white matter development with semantic knowledge. So that underlying construct of verbal or conceptual based knowledge. And we'll be doing so by, um, we ran a principal component analysis to derive factor scores related to the semantic knowledge um, factor. And we did so by looking at the raw scores for Wasi vocabulary, similarities, letter word identification on the Woodcock-Johnson, which is basic reading ability, uh, passage comprehension, uh, reading comprehension, and the CVLT trials one through five, which measures verbal learning in a semantic context. The, uh, the semantic knowledge factor explains 72% of the variance in performance on these measures, and they were all significantly loaded onto this construct of semantic knowledge that we identified. So Tom Shin Shill in a 2003 review uh, stated that the search for the neuroanatomical locus of semantic memory has simultaneously led us nowhere and everywhere. So we're going to look and see where it leads us today. <laughs> so uh, Patterson in his 2007 review uh, described two theoretical positions for the localization of semantic knowledge. Uh, the distributed view where features of an object or information about the word is stored in association cortex associated with, um, for example, um, color or motion associated with that concept. And the other theoretical view is that there's a distributed storage of this information that is centralized at a semantic hub, which pulls this information together in an integrated fashion. Uh, other researchers have theorized that this the hub exists in the frontal lobe and exists as an executive network that pulls this information together. And this is based on research in functional imaging in adults as well as um, Patterson argued that semantic dementia, which is t primarily localized to that interior temporal lobe, uh, 
may give us some information about where this semantic hub exists. So for, this is, again, whoops, our total sample. And we'll be looking at school-aged children, ages 7 to 16, um, on the semantic knowledge factor and how that relates to brain maturation. This sample includes 136 children, ages 7 to 16. Whoops, there we go. Uh, mean age of 11.7, about exactly half female and majority right-handed. Okay, so there's a strong logarithmic relationship between uh, semantic knowledge over age, which explains 69% of the variance in semantic knowledge. And now we'll look at some of the, the relationship between gray matter volume across development in this age group. So what you're seeing here is decreases in cortical density in the parietal lobe and increases in the orbital frontal, a little bit in the anterior temporal region. Um, and this is what you would expect with uh, develop, cortical development in this age group. Okay. Right, so now looking at the relationship between gray matter and semantic knowledge, up here we have um, just that association between gray matter and semantic knowledge and below controlling for age. So here we see more diffuse decreases in gray matter density and once you control for age, a lot of that is eliminated. There still is some um, relationship in the parietal lobe. Uh, as far as increases, you have the orbital frontal cortex, anterior temporal lobe that I showed you on the last slide maybe related to the sem semantic hub. And then also some cerebellum increases in um, gray matter density. And those are maintained when controlling for age, unlike some of the results in the previous sample. In fact, we see additional correlations in the right parasylvian cortex as well. Okay. So now looking at FA, or white matter development, and that increase in structural um, organization, um, just with age, we see some very strong correlations, which are um, indicated by brighter colors. Um, and it is somewhat lateralized to the left hemisphere, as it was with the total sample. Okay. Um, now looking at the relationship between FA, or white matter structural organization, and um, semantic knowledge, we see a great asymmetry between or where the left hemisphere is really involved in greater organization during this time period related to semantic knowledge. And once you control for, and, and the areas involved are some of the areas we would expect to be involved in um, the functional, net, the networks involved in language processing, including the arcuate fasciculus, superior and inferior longitudinal fasciculus, um, and in the right hemisphere, the corona radiata, which is um, in, uh, the connections between the corpus sending connections from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere here. And once controlling for age, some of these correlations become even stronger. They kind of pop out more. Um, and I'll particularly point to the cerebell cerebellar peduncle, right and left. And the connections kind of inc uh, extend further in the temporal lobe down to those temporal poles. And this um, here is mean diffusivity and the negative correlations across development in this sample. So we see a lot of decreases in mean diffusivity, which is expected. Um, it should be representing increased myelination. Um, and this is just across age in this uh, school age sample. But when we look at the relationship between diffusivity and the semantic knowledge factor, there were no significant correlations. Okay. So in conclusion, the gray matter and white matter information, particularly FA, yielded complementary information that may give us more, that gives us more information about the um, complex neuroanatomical network involved in language and semantic knowledge. So also, if you want to, ref if reflecting back to 
the previous sample, unlike in young age, um, in the young sample and preschool aged children, there was a unique relationship between cognitive ability and any structural changes uh, beyond that of just age related development. Um, and possibly that may be due to genetic versus in environmental influences. This is consistent with literature suggesting that early on you see a high genetic influence of maturation of brain development, which kind of, which drives acquisition of language skills early on. And then later on you see more of an environmental influence on these structural changes uh, where these, where experience kind of can shape cortical networks. And this also fits um, well with the idea of a distributed network with a hub where we see parietal cortex and association areas highly interconnected and uh, associated with a semantic knowledge controlling for age. And these connections feed into both temporal and frontal networks of language processing. So now I will pass the presentation on to Ariana Tartzelvin, who will be presenting on some very interesting results in executive control and structural changes in this same sample of school-aged children. Okay. Hi, so I will be continuing along this course of development and now we're going to look at the relationship between structural changes in gray and white matter as they relate to set shifting abilities, working memory, and executive control. So we pretty much saved the best for last. Um, most interesting. And as Jess said, I will be presenting on the same school age samples, so it's kids from ages 7 to 16. So to start off with some background in cortical development at this age, um, it's both cortical pruning and increases in neuronal activity within and between different regions could underlie improvements in cognitive abilities. So therefore, I will be discussing changes in both gray matter development and white matter development related to cognitive abilities, again, specifically those related to executive functioning. And it's worth mentioning that cortical gray matter follows an inverted U-shaped development. So for instance, frontal gray matter peaks around 11 or 12 years old for boys and girls, whereas temporal gray matter peaks around 16 years. And then dorsolateral prefrontal cortex um, gray matter, which we know is important for controlling impulses, is among the latest uh, to mature without reaching adult dimensions until the early 20s. Now, white matter growth is the main source of increased brain volume during child development and continues well into the second decade for some brain regions. And as mentioned before, maturation of relatively restricted um, regions in white matter has been correlated with the development of specific cognitive functions. And as Dr. Williams mentioned, DTI is an excellent technique for measuring these age-related changes in biological properties of white matter in vivo. This type of information is necessary in order for us to quantify these subtle changes in white matter organization with maturation and to relate those changes to both behavior and cognitive changes over time. So the objective for these set of analyses is to examine the role of cortical development and white matter connectivity in the development of different aspects of executive control. And with the measures that we pulled for these analyses, we'll be focusing, we'll be focusing on these more specific aspects of executive functioning. So we, again, have this whole sample, and this part that I will be reporting on is a subset of that entire sample. So it will just be the school-aged children, and this is the exact same group that Jessica just presented on. I'll just be addressing different measures. There we go. 
So now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with these measures, so I won't spend too much time on them. But the two measures that we use for these analyses are the BRIEF, which is the Behavioral Rating Inventory of Executive Functioning, and we use the parent form. So I just want to emphasize here that we used parent report measures. And the important thing to note here is that this measure has two primary indices, both a metacognition index and a behavioral regulation index. So the metacognition index, which taps more into the dorsolateral areas, includes things like initiation, working memory, planning, and organizing. And then the behavioral regulation index, which tap, taps more into medial, frontal, and limbic areas, includes abilities like inhibitory control, set shifting, and emotional control. Now for the second measure we used, it's the CANTAB IED, so the Cambridge Neuropsychological Test Automated Battery. So this is not a parent report, this is a computerized battery, and, in, and it's basically an analog to the Wisconsin card sorting task. And so in order for someone to proceed through the test, they meet a set of criterion, and they continue through certain trials. So this um, in particular looks at rule acquisition and reversal. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this would be a typical figure from the IED in which the participant would press one of the shapes and they would get feedback to see if they were correct or not, and then they would continue um, to press the shapes until they continue guessing correct answers. So here we're looking at cognitive performance on these measures over time. So we have the brief metacognition, the brief behavioral, and then the can tab down here. And you can see they're all pretty much showing you the same message. And I would just like to note here that this slightly negative correlation that you see is representative of better performance on these measures. And so as you can see, there's a lot of variance, which means something else besides age is accounting for these scores. So perhaps th this could be explained by areas of brain development. Okay, so as you can see here on the left, we have the T1 scan for age. And I'd like to point out you have both positive and negative correlations. And so again, we have this nice color key down here showing that the red and orange colors are positive and the blue and the green are more are negative. And so as you can see, as the sample gets older, gray matter diminishes in these patterns, except in the temporal poles um, where the cortex grows a little bit. Now one thing I'd like to note for the, both the brief behavioral index and for the brief metacognition index is that this color key is reversed. So the red and orange represent positive, or negative, sorry, and the uh, blue and green is, sorry, red and orange negative, blue and green positive. But this is representative of better abilities. So for example, with the brief behavioral index, it's representative of better inhibitory abilities, shifting and emotional control. And so you can see um, that we pretty much have everything isolated on both the white matter organization and the diffusivity um, images to the left ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. And these areas are associated with greater inhibitory control and, and greater set shifting abilities as well as emotional control. So together they sort of um, support those findings. And then... So next we have the brief metacognition index and you'll see here that it's very similar to the brief behavioral. So it's very lateralized to the left hemisphere and there's a little bit more, um, the diffusion here you can see is a little bit uh, more diffuse in the MD image here on the left hemisphere. And again, because the color is reversed, this is representative of better planning abilities, better working memory, monitoring, initiating, and organization of materials, or organizational abilities. There we go. 
And then here we have the CAN tab. And so again, the CAN tab is not a parent report. This is just a computerized neuropsych battery for children. And so this is their performance. And you can see here that for the white matter organization, it's again lateralized more to the left hemisphere. And you can see that it's um, really more um, the frontal lobe. And this is something, um, given a task of mental flexibility, you would expect to see this type of white matter organization where the frontal lobes are highly implicated. Right over here. So although the brief um, parent report was not significantly associated with age, there was significant associations between brief parent ratings and structural maturation. So given the lack of, significant, of a significant relationship between age and brief scores, it's not very surprising that controlling for age in this sample did not significantly change the associations between the brief, uh, between brief and, and, um, and brain maturation. So as the past presentations have shown, cognitive abilities are associated with structural changes. And to add to these findings, these analyses have added a pretty meaningful contribution in that parent self-report is also associated with structural changes. And to my knowledge, this is the first of any study to show this. So now I'll be passing the mic back to Dr. Michael Williams for just some concluding thoughts. Well, Christina gave me permission to do, to, uh, do my usual loose associations with the, with the findings. You, you've been presented with a, a number of just sort of basic empirical findings. Uh, the first thing point I need to make is the, the data set itself was created to establish a normative standard, and especially to compare that normative standard then to pathological groups. Well, we've taken the, uh, you know, it also gave us the opportunity to discover, to, to discover development patterns. And these surprised me in some places, and uh, they seem pretty conventional findings in others. The fact that aging, age was related so strongly to the data is something that's obvious in development. Uh, the other, but the, what, what surprised me, uh, I mean, we had no really a priori, you know, theories about this. This is the first time this kind of data set's been analyzed this way. I mean, the idea of finding a, a relationship between brain maturation and parent ratings, I thought was just never going to happen. The, the parent ratings are just, you know, they're, they're uh, basically valid for certain purposes, but to, to correlate them with DTI measures, I thought was very unusual that it would come out this way. What it suggests is, is that parents are observing their children gaining more and more behavioral control. They, their ratings change over the course of development, and that behavioral control is at least partially attributable to maturation of the brain itself. The other thing that, was, that kind of surprised me, uh, sort of surprised me, not as much as the former one, but the, the role of the left hemisphere development. Uh, it, it, I, again, not trusting the DTI measures so much, I was thinking, gosh, it's amazing that language development, obviously you would think be correlated with with uh, the left hemisphere's development more than the right. But behavioral ratings by parents uh, were also correlated with the left hemisphere's development. And it suggests to me that as the child matures, as their brain matures and they acquire language, they acquire behavioral control from that. That language is mediating behavioral control and of course language is, is developing itself. This, uh, you know, I, in my loose associations, I hearken back to, re I'm preparing a book now in Luria and that's exactly what Lurie would tell over and over again, how language mediates basically all cognitive functions. So executive control is mediated by language. Uh, that gets understated, I think, in our literature, uh, but that's something we, I think we supported. But also Piaget. I mean, Piaget talked about this a lot, how language, development of language was the great mediator for pre-operational, operational thought and course of hypothesis testing. Uh, on a more minor note, we discovered, I think, that mean diffusivity is not a good marker for uh, development, that it's the FA values. And something I didn't really mention or emphasize before, the FA values are showing you the underlying integrity of the white matter. So as they change over development, it means the white matter is becoming more and more integrated, more and more refined. The loss of gray matter over uh, development is something that's been shown in a number of other studies. What it looks like is happening is, you know, the brain is being sculpted by development and experience, by maturation and experience. And 
the FA values are reflecting this as well as a, is a drop in, uh, in, in gray matter volumes. Okay, so our future studies will be to refine this even further. I, I'd love if they had given, if they had given a, a, a Piagetian tasks instead of these conventional, you know, neuropsych tests. It would, have, it would have get, it would have given a test of Piaget's theory and Luria's ideas, a, you know, an interesting. It was the kind of test they would have really appreciated because Piaget, of course, never really thought of himself as, as a psychologist. As a genetic epistemologist, he was interested in maturation of the brain and how that, and he didn't say that so much in his writing, but that was really what he's referring to. So that would be a cool thing to do. We'll try to abstract some of the data, maybe to test some of those ideas. Uh, primarily, we want to map out uh, development at different age levels better so that we can map out development better. And then take pathological groups. Because, see, they have also autistic children, for example, that they've examined this way. And other, other groups at the NDAR, if you go to the NDAR website, you can see all these. And you can even download the manual for how they collected all the data. I didn't cover that in any detail at all because it's so laid out so well there. But our, our mission would then be to examine differences, uh, gender differences, or sex differences would be when, uh, girls are supposed to you know, mature differently than boys, and executive control ratings ought to reflect that. And, uh, that's, that's never been examined with DTI measures. It, it would be fascinating to do that, a number of other things. At any rate, that's my uh, rumination so far. I want to add, leave some time, however, for you guys to ask questions and say what occurred to you in the patterns. And please come to the microphone if you... Or you if you're too far from the microphone, just ask your question, I'll repeat it. Yes. Yes, to register it and normalize it, because the TT1s have higher resolution. Yeah. So that, like, you know, this is all really new to me, so is that a so, Of course, Carol can find more detail. I'll just make one comment first. The, the, the uh, registration, there are two ways to do this. Basically, we did whole brain volume analysis. The other way is to take individual pathways and examine them. And, and a lot of studies have, for example, shown that FA and different pathways associated with different cognitive variables. Uh, the T1, this is uh, Carol's, Carol, now he, he knew about this. This is not like a brand new modeling, but his, his uh, approach to it was the other way, where you, where you get your templates from the subjects and map everything to the T1s of the subjects. Is that a fair statement? <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, I could probably tell you a bit more about it, but I'm not unclear of what your question is. Uh, Well, it's, it's really not modeling the DTI. All I'm simply doing is computing my transformations on the T1 and applying them to the DTI. If you remember from a previous slide, DTI images have rather low resolution. And the same, you know, the same is true for any, basically any scan where you need to get a lot of information. And with DTI, you have to get a lot of information. But the same is true for fMRI, and it's not an uncommon scheme to simply do all your transformations on T1. Because when we set out to do this project, we actually had no interest in analyzing the T1 data. You know, that's really been done quite a bit. And even though we found some interesting patterns, I don't think, I don't think we did any groundbreaking work there. But because we had it, it completely alleviated all concerns of registration problems within DTI data. And, this, and it, like I said, the same is true for fMRI data. One of the more common processing schemes is to compute all your transformations on T1 and simply apply them to fMRI. And it's simply because fMRI has much lower spatial resolution, just like DTI. And, and you have to keep in mind that the, these are children's brains who are changing in size. We don't have an adult set where we can just use a you know, common um, 
right. template. Right. There, there are common DTI templates. The ICBM 152 from Johns Hopkins is one that gets very commonly used for uh, a normal space in DTI of adults. But we didn't want to use that because that introduces so much inherent error because it's, it's adults. They're so <laughs> different. And so, like I said, it was probably a bit of overkill to generate a unique template for each one of these samples. I don't know if you caught it, but the difference between uh, the, the one that Jessica used and the one that Ari used, uh, there were maybe, uh, uh, maybe 10 patients who weren't in one of the samples. And I computed, uh, yes, so, sorry, subjects. <laughs> and I computed a template for each one of those samples. I think that probably was overkill. But again, the, in any imaging, the more you can minimize error, the more you can in, minimize the inherent deformation of the data, the better off you are. And so that's why it's, it's very commonly done. And not so common in DTI, but very commonly done in other imaging to use the T1 to drive every other uh, deformation. And really the underlying thing is, is resolution. T ones being so high, high, more high resolution that they're the, they're the model for the shape of the brain. In relation to the brief, right. um, did you use the raw scores or the T scores? Because I'm thinking about in relation to norms of aging over time. If you just use the T scores and had normalcy, you might not see change because it's it's already normed. Um, so the behavior wouldn't change over time. Yes, the, the, the crucial aspect, of course, if you, we standardize often on age stratified samples, and obviously if we did that, we'd take out the developmental pattern completely. Mm -hmm. So it had to be raw scores. It was raw scores for everything. Okay, so it's raw scores. They do have standard scores, however, in the data set, if you're mm -hmm. interested in other studies that want to use standard scores. But obviously, you know, you're studying development, it's got to be, it can't be a stratified score. Yeah, that's then, really interesting that it didn't change and it was just raw scores. Yeah, there's some of the measures, I mean, my, my, I always go back to the simple explanation. I think what happens is the variance is low in a lot of those because they're really screening instruments. They're not really stratifying. Mm -hmm. They don't stratify, you know, we have that old problem in neuropsychology where we're, you know, we're either interested in stratifying among normals or stratifying among patients versus normals. And if you design an instrument that, that's designed for the latter, it's often a much more simpler tasks and things like that that, that the uh, normals can all do, but the patients all fail. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a problem in this literature as well. It's, it's, uh, when you're dealing with real little children, you, know, you, you can't give them the whisk, you know, because it's obviously too difficult. So you give them a test that's relatively easy. You don't get variance. And this, these all represent, all these patterns we've shown you are correlations between FA and, 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 and mainly FA and the scores, uh, you know, the, the, and representing the, the correlation between, say, the brief and a particular voxel in the image. Mm -hmm. And so that's all, all these um, caveats about correlation and regression apply to this. Uh, one other thing in relation to the brief, um, I, I'm a little familiar with the battery. I've looked at it online. Uh, have you ever looked at uh, structure in relation to cognitive function and then behavior to see if it mediates so you can actually have that kind of bottom-up idea of you see changes in structure over time, changes in cognition, and then behavior at the level to see if maybe that can tab on the last one mediated the relationship between yeah, structure that's, and... That's an excellent hypothesis. Yeah. It would be great to test that one. That's, uh, we'll put that on the list. Okay. <laughs> that's a great idea. So I think this is tremendous and uh, exciting. Um, and the merger of uh, neuroimaging with neuropsychology, I think, is uh, our future. And so uh, I, I think this is wonderful. But I, I have coming I, coming from you, Aaron. That's a, that's an incredible compliment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, this is this is this is where this is uh, this is bringing technology to uh, neuropsychology. But that I mean, you're using paper and pencil tests, yeah. <laughs> and you're using 21st century technology. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, so One of them's got to catch up or regress or something. So, yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully some of our, I know. our tests. But, but so I have many, many questions. I, I was attending another session, so I only came in here okay. halfway. So uh, obviously, I love this technology. Are you doing other things to look at networks? Are you doing resting state? Are you doing any connectivity mapping? The, you know, the, the, this, yeah. this beautiful 
lateral inferior frontal uh, uh, change here, there, there are probably nodes within that that are actually the most important thing yes. to be paying attention to and not, not necessarily everything. Yeah. And that's, that's what I want to know. And then the other thing is... Uh, uh, Let me respond to that. Okay. I, I've applied these as I have learned them. So at first I learned fMRI, now I'm learning DTI. Okay. And so that's how I learn it. I, you know, do these, these kind of projects, and then I learn it. And fortunately, you know, I have a great crew here who, who have helped me along the way. We've helped each other uh, and to make that happen. But, that's, but connectivity modeling is my next thing to learn. <laughs> well, um, I, you brought up the uh, autism. So um, there are lots of things in autism look very, very normal. Yeah. Um, uh, from a developmental uh, standpoint, but it's really down to the connectivity issue uh, mm -hmm. where the, the differences are. But then the other thing is that we really need to do as a profession and as neuropsychologists to get this into the clinic is we need to know the single child. We, right. we, we need to know what these metrics mean for the single child. Yes and uh, for the developmental neuropsychologists here who see children that have delays or who have normal progression at some point and then seem to uh, reach a stalemate. Yes. We, we, need, uh, we need to have this to help answer those questions. I'm with you 100%. So, it, could, okay. it could form a really neat way, a diagnostic package to include behavior, testing, and neuroimaging. The nerve, you know, it just hasn't, it's getting there. I mean, the fMRI clinical work is now, in, you know, is, is, is now billable. <laughs> right. You know, and that may, maybe, maybe that's the threshold at which things really happen. But clearly this, gosh, you know, uh, there's so many development disorders that go through child development clinics that haven't even examined with any of this. The, the project that we got the data from, though, was like a first really good step. I mean, it's a prominent center doing it the right way to essentially get a normal uh, pattern for uh, DTI, they did, did T1. They also did spectroscopy, mm -hmm. uh, which you can download and look at. And, that's, right. and they are super normal kids. They're, I mean, they, they excluded their exclusionary criteria was amazing. They matched the uh, census of 2000 for the, all the demographics, and they were very rigorous about recruiting and to make sure that they weren't going to get biases in the sample and things. Right. So this I would is, almost this trust them. Is that what that's Yes, what, yeah. the NDAR. Okay. Well, the right. NDAR is the global right. uh, database uh, managers. Right. This was the uh, one particularly for the MRI studies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Thank Aaron. you. So um, I also had to walk in late. Um, I was wondering, my last read of the literature on DTI and, and language uh, suggested that the um, extreme capsule was important. And I saw uh, some evidence that you implicated the uncinate fasciculus. Did you see, is there any evidence that uh, extreme capsule is involved? Were your measures sufficient resolution to distinguish between those two tracks? So we actually uh, did see some evidence that might indicate it, but I think, I think the Rather than focusing on a single tiny little bit of anatomy like that, I think the the takeaway is that we had such profound effects in the left hemisphere. And a lot of the language studies that we presented showed specific to the left hemisphere, arcuate fasciculus, uncinate fasciculus, even what I believe may have been the middle longitudinal fasciculus. And certainly to to say that those wouldn't involve something like the uh, external capsule, uh, I, I think, would be flawed. So I absolutely agree with you that it was probably there. It just wasn't one of the larger things that we focused on. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're reaching some of the limits of FA resolution, I think. But that'll improve. <laughs> it's amazing how things keep getting better. Hmm. Any other questions, concerns? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.